Our reading this morning is from 1 Samuel chapter 17. Yesterday, we heard the first section of that reading where the champion named Goliath uh, came out onto the battlefield, set the agenda, and the Israelites, including Saul, were just a little bit terrified, as rabbits in a headlight, Andrew said. Our reading today picks up the chapter um, from verse 12. I'm reading from the NIV version, and I'm going to read it for us now. Now David was the son of an Ephrathite named Jesse, who was from Bethlehem in Judah. Jesse had eight sons, and in Saul's time, he was very old. Jesse's three eldest sons had followed Saul to the war. The firstborn was Eliab, the second Abinadab, and the third Shammah. David was the youngest. The three eldest followed Saul, but David went back and forth from Saul to tend to his father's sheep at Bethlehem. For 40 days, The Philistine came forward every morning and every evening, and he took his stand. Now Jesse said to his youngest son, David, Take this ephah of roasted grain and these ten loaves of bread for your brothers and hurry to the camp. Take along these ten cheeses, I love that bit, take along these ten cheeses to the commander of their unit. See how your brothers are, and bring back some assurance from them. They were with Saul and all the men of Israel in the valley of Elah, fighting against the Philistines. Early in the morning, David left the flock in the care of a shepherd, loaded up, and set out as Jesse had directed. He reached the camp as the army was going out to his positions, shouting the war cry, Israel and the Philistines were drawing up their lines, facing each other. David, left to the things with the keeper of the supplies, ran to the battle lines and asked his brothers how they were. As David was talking with them, Goliath, the Philistine champion from Gath, stepped out from his lines and shouted his usual defiance, and David heard it. Whenever the Israelites saw the man Goliath, they all fled from him in great fear. Now the Israelites had been saying, do you see how this man keeps coming out? He comes out to defy Israel. The king will give great wealth to the man who kills him. He'll also give him his daughter in marriage and he will exempt his family from taxes in Israel. David asked the men standing near him, what will be done for the man who kills this Philistine and removes this disgrace from Israel? Who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? Well, the men repeated to David what they had been saying and they told him this is what will be done for the man who kills him. When Eliab, David's eldest brother, heard him speaking with the men, he burned with anger at him, and he asked him, Why have you come down here, and with whom did you leave those few sheep in the wilderness? I know how conceited you are, and how wicked your heart is. You've only come down here to watch the battle. Now what have I done? said David. Can't I even speak? He then turned away to someone else and brought up the same matter, and the men answered him as before. What David said was overheard, and it was reported to Saul, and King Saul sent for him. But David said to Saul, Let no one lose heart on account of this Philistine. Your servant will go and fight him. And Saul replied, you are not able to go out against this Philistine and fight him. 
You're only a young man. He has been a warrior since his youth. But David said to Saul, Your servant has been keeping his father's sheep. When a lion or a bear came and carried off a sheep from the flock, I went after it and I struck it and I rescued the sheep from its mouth. When it turned on me, I seized it by its hair, I struck it and I killed it. Your servant has killed both the lion and the bear. This uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them because he has defied the armies of the living God. The Lord who rescued me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear will rescue me from the hand of this Philistine. Saul said to David, Go, and the Lord be with you. This is the word of the Lord. I'm going to invite Bishop Andrew to come and speak to us his second message, the foundation of his confidence. Shall we pray for him as he comes to us? God of love, we thank you for Andrew for the time he's spent studying your word, reflecting on it, ready uh, to present this message to us. Lord, may it be your message May you speak into the heart of each one of us so that we might be your changed people for your glory. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much, Sherry. It's lovely to be with you again. Great to hear from Roy too. Thank you very much, Roy, for that uh, really inspiring interview. My, My grandparents were missionaries out in China between 1922 and 1938. And when they returned, the... Chinese Japanese War and they returned back to to England my grandfather then led the Mild May Mission Hospital in the east end of London through the Blitz and beyond very courageous people and uh, it's been wonderful to hear the way the Lord has grown the church among uh, Chinese people over the last uh, few decades when my grandfather died uh, Mao was uh, had his uh, reign was still uh, very uh, present in people's, people's minds and my grandfather died not knowing whether there were still Christians in China or how many Christians there were in China. My, my grandmother lived on for many more, two, two or three more decades and began to hear amazing stories of what the Lord had been doing over that time and we do praise God for our Chinese brothers and sisters. And lovely that reminder this morning, mission is to everywhere, from everywhere. It's not just people going out from these shores and doing mission. Uh, Lovely to hear uh, Roy's experience coming to England, that heart for mission, not just among the Chinese people, but among uh, the poor and the homeless in our communities, and going out to Ukraine to to bless people out there. It's so exciting to be part of this global movement, isn't it? Brothers and sisters from all around the world seeking to glorify our great living God. So we, uh, for those of us who weren't here yesterday, I think Sherry's given us a little reminder of what's in those first 11 chapters, uh, verses of uh, 1 Samuel chapter 17. The, the Israelite army, Saul at their head, paralyzed like rabbits sort of in the headlights of uh, Goliath, this Philistine champion. And uh, in today's reading, of course, the situation begins to shift because we're introduced to this eighth son of Jesse, young David. We've already encountered David in the previous chapter. The first mention of him is in 1 Samuel chapter 16. And there he's given something of the Cinderella treatment. On the one hand, we can hardly imagine a better reference to him than the one given by one of Saul's servants in 1 Samuel 16 and verse 18. Here's the reference. I have seen a son of Jesse who knows how to play the harp. He is a brave man and a warrior He speaks well and is a fine-looking man, and the Lord is with him. Now, I quite like that as a reference, wouldn't you? I don't think it's likely to happen, certainly not the young man or handsome, but uh, I know how to play the bassoon. That's not quite as romantic as the harp, but that's a good going. Uh, And so on the one hand, he's he's portrayed in in this wonderful, upbeat way, and yet on the other hand, he is, we're told, the eighth son of Jesse. Now, if you know a bit about Hebrew numbers, you know that seven is the magic number. Seven is the number of perfection. 
So the eighth son is a kind of afterthought. Okay, they didn't watch the time of the month or whatever it was. And here comes, here comes, uh, comes David. He's the eighth son. And there's a Hebrew word for it. It's the word hackathon. And it's a rather disparaging kind of word. He's the hackathon. He's the runt, the runt of the family. And uh, this Hebrew word uh, hackathon is actually lived out in 1 Samuel 16. Do you remember what happens when Samuel comes to Jesse and he says, I'd like to see all of your sons because the Lord has anointed one of them to be king of Israel. And do you remember what Jesse does? He brings seven sons before Samuel because that's the, the number of perfection. And it's only the afterthoughts, uh, David, who's called in at the last minute when Samuel goes down the list and says, no, it's not one of these. Have you got any other kids? And, and, uh, and Jesse then says slightly embarrassedly, well, I, you know, seven's the number of perfection. But yeah, there is the runt. He's out in the fields watching the, shepherd, uh, watching the sheep. And then he gets called in. And of course, he is the one whom the Lord anoints to be king over Israel. Like Cinderella... He's both attractive, but he's not invited to the ball. And yet, of course, it's David whom Samuel anoints. The Spirit of the Lord comes upon him in power. And from this moment on, there are clear parallels between the storyline in 1 Samuel and the storyline in the Gospels. In the Gospels, Jesus is baptized by John, you remember, and filled with the Spirit. And he immediately goes out into the wilderness for 40 days and 40 nights where he's tested by Satan. In 1 Samuel, David is anointed by Samuel and filled with the Spirit, and he immediately goes out to the battlefield where, for 40 days and 40 nights, Goliath has been threatening and goading the people of God. And from now on, the stories, the book of Samuel, will be just as obsessed with the person of David as the Gospels are by the person of David's greater son, by the person of Jesus of Nazareth. And so we have this simple domestic story, and Sherry loves it, and I love it too. The hackathon, given another menial job, bring out the picnic basket to your big brothers who are serving on the battlefield. I like Jesse say, they're fighting the, the, the Philistines. Now, you know and I know they're not fighting the Philistines. They're like scared rabbits in the face of the oncoming juggernaut. But anyway, Jesse doesn't know that, so he says, take along this food for your, for your brothers, and take along some cheeses to keep the commanders happy. That's a very nice touch, isn't it? You know, perhaps the commanders won't send them into the front of the battle line if they've been bribed with some good gorgonzola or whatever it is. And then he says, come back from the battle line and tell me how everything's going, how, you, how my, my sons are go, getting on. You know, are they still alive? How's it, how's it all going? It's just another ordinary life, a day in the life of this shepherd boy, you know, just another command and obey your uh, dad's orders. And at first, all seems well to David. As he arrives in verse 20, the army are taking up their position and the Israelite army are shouting out their battle cry, we're told. What was their battle cry? Probably, the Lord reigns. The Lord reigns. It all looks very impressive. And we know, of course, that that cry is becoming increasingly desperate and hollow, but David doesn't know that. But then it happens. It happens as it had happened for the last 40 days and 40 nights, 40 mornings, 40 evenings. Goliath, the Philistine champion from Gath, one huge mass of bronze glittering in the Palestinian sun with his scary armor and scary uh, weaponry, appears and shouts out his usual defiance, And the Israelites' hollow war cry is replaced by the pathetic sound of an army running for cover. And clearly by this stage, Saul is getting really desperate. Like a ruler in one of the old fairy stories, he's offered in verse 25 to give great wealth to anyone who kills Goliath alongside an enticing tax break. He and his family are never going to have to pay tax again. Well, that's almost worth taking Goliath on for, isn't it? <laughs> and, uh, and he's also offered the hand of his daughter in marriage. Now, whether that last promise is a positive one is open to question. David, of course, is later to find that Saul's daughter, Michal, is a bit of a handful. And judging from his later behavior, I certainly wouldn't fancy Saul as my future father-in-law. <laughs> 
But David is clearly interested in the potential reward as he spells out his disgust in the situation in verse 26. In my version of the Bible here, the new RSV, he says, What shall be done for the man who kills this Philistine and takes away the reproach from Israel? Who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? And note what's new in those two questions. Note what's going on. Up until now, we've heard the name of this giant from Gath. He is Goliath, the Philistine champion. He's interestingly the only Philistine in the whole Bible whom we know by name. So his name, Goliath, strikes fear into the hearts of the people. I just noticed, I was talking yesterday about how the story of David and Goliath is one of only four stories which the people in the streets in Birmingham, four Old Testament stories that they might have vaguely heard of. And I was rather amused when I came to the end of my thing to see that this stand holding up the speaker here comes from Goliath Studio. So Goliath is, is alive and well, even in the church in Cars Lane. So... Uh, so this name Goliath has been striking terror into the fear of every Israelite soldier. But David never uses Goliath's name. He doesn't use his name once. He simply calls him this Philistine or this uncircumcised Philistine or even this disgrace. In verse 36, he compares him to an animal. He says that it's no better than taking on a lion or a bear. And it's not just that David stops using Goliath's name, it's also that he starts using a new name for God, the name the living God. Who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? Up to this point in this chapter, the name of God hasn't been mentioned at all. Now the name of God is mentioned, and not just the name of God, but the name the living God. Now, if you're one of those people who likes to read the Bible from beginning to end and has done that from time to time, you will know, well, you've probably forgotten, but you might know that this is only uh, the very few occasions up to this point in the storyline of the Bible where that phrase, the living God, has been used. It is used once on Mount Sinai after Moses proclaims the Ten Commandments. Deuteronomy 5, chapter, verse 26, if you're taking notes. What mortal man has ever heard the voice of the living God speaking out of fire as we have and survived? So the giving of the law, and it's used once by Joshua as he prepares to lead God's people through the River Jordan and into the Promised Land. And he reminded them, this is how you will know that the living God is among you and that he will certainly drive out the Canaanites, Hittites, Hivites, Perizzites, Gilgitites, Amorites, and Jebusites. That's Joshua 3 and verse 10. So just those two occasions. And now that phrase, the living God, is used twice in just one chapter, in 1 Samuel chapter 17, on the lips of David. And of course, it goes on to be a phrase that is used again and again, and it becomes a very significant phrase in the New Testament. You are the Christ, the Son of God the living God. There are key moments in the history of Israel, in other words, the giving of the law, the possession of the land, and now the establishment of David as king, and later of Jesus as the Messiah, the son of the living God, in which this phase is powerfully deployed. And as Goliath is reduced to an uncircumcised Philistine, a disgrace, a beast, and as God is magnified to the living God, so it becomes clear that Goliath is not simply defying the army of Israel, but he's defying the armies of the living God. And this balance, which seemed to be that way around, suddenly shifts. If you've got the living God on your side, then my goodness, whichever way around it is, uh, then, then, then the balance is going to shift, isn't it? And this is where we sense the balance of this whole chapter beginning to shift. And in one way, of course, nothing has changed. The Israelites are still standing there, as paralyzed as ever. Saul, their king, is still confused and weak. Goliath is still standing there, all nine foot of him, or six foot seven, according to the Septuagint. The only change is that Israel now has a leader in her midst, an anointed leader, a spirit-filled leader, a leader who's prepared to speak and act, and even to put his life on the line for the sake of the living God. 
in our history as a nation, we're still moved, aren't we, by the leadership and oratory of Winston Churchill, named a few years back as the greatest Briton who's ever lived. So here's a sample of one of his most famous speeches to Parliament on May the 13th, 1940, during the darkest days of the war. And I won't try and imitate his, his accent. You ask, what is our policy? I will say it is to wage war by sea, land and air with all our might and with all the strength that God can give us. To wage war against a monstrous tyranny never surpassed in the dark, lamentable catalogue of human crime. This is our policy. You ask, what is our aim? I can answer with one word, victory. Victory at all costs, victory in spite of all terror, victory however long and hard the road may be, for without victory there is no survival. And in one sense, nothing changed as a result of that speech to Parliament. But in another sense, everything changed. Because here was a leader with the heart of David. A leader who spoke of the living God. A leader that you would follow to death or glory. So back to David and how did the paralyzed rabbits respond? The men in verse 27 seem to be quietly impressed David's little speech in the previous verse had clearly made an impact as the living God had entered their thinking for the very first time. But Eliab, his brother, his big brother, in verse 28, was quite different. In my version of this text, he gets angry against David and says, Why have you come down? With whom have you left those few sheep in the wilderness? He's saying, You're not only a shepherd, but you've only got a few sheep. I mean, my goodness, he cuts him down to size, doesn't he? I know your presumption and the evil of your heart. You've only come down to watch the battle. Rather like those people on the motorway who slow down to see the accident. You know, you're that kind of person, Eliab is saying to his little brother. So what's going on here? Well, Eliab may well have been jealous, very jealous, of his little son, brother. Because if you remember, Eliab's the eldest of all of them. And he was the first one that Samuel prayed over. And Samuel saw this handsome man, this tall man, and said, Surely this is the one whom the Lord is anointing. And the Lord said, No. And so, of course, he worked his way down the other brothers. And then let's get in the one from the field. And, uh, and it's David whom the Lord anoints. So there's kind of some serious sibling jealousy. The Old Testament does sibling jealousy in spades, doesn't it? If, you're, if, if you belong to a family that's sibling jealousy, my goodness, there are plenty of case studies in the Old Testament. Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, I and mean, what a dysfunctional family. It's extraordinary whom God calls, isn't it, in many ways. And this is going on here as well. So he may have felt, rather like Joseph's brothers felt, that David had become too cocky for his own good. But Eliab's reaction also expressed a deep frustration that he must have felt, and all of the people of the army of Israel must have felt, which had built up morning and evening, morning and evening for 40 days and 40 nights. It is hugely frustrating to be paralyzed. I've only been paralyzed for 48 hours in my life. It happened rather undramatically on a beach when I sort of pulled something. And I was in agony and I couldn't move anything for 48 hours. And then sort of things began to work again, praise the Lord. But how incredibly frustrating to be paralyzed. Hugely frustrating to be governed by fear. And then a young person comes along and says that it's easy. All you have to do is believe in the living God. Well, it's a recipe for an explosion, isn't it? And that's precisely what happens. And then Saul, now he's the next to hear David's little speech, and his reaction is predictable. Again, he doesn't mention God to begin with. He simply says of David, you're only a boy, and he's been a fighting man from his youth. The chief rabbit remains paralyzed by fear. But notice David's reaction. He's tactful enough to realize that Saul is in a delicate position as the one who should be taking on Goliath himself. If you have a king to rule over you who's going to fight your battles, you expect him to do it. So he's tactful enough to do that. That's why he emphasizes to Saul that he is your servant. This is a model in tact. You know, if you're a younger person and you're needing to talk to your older pastor because you think that they're going wrong, learn from this. Because actually this is a great model intact. But David's also bold enough, bold enough to speak of his past experiences in life, of God, of success against the human odds, outside their 
in, on the hillside, he's had victories over lions and bears, private victories no one else has seen. This one is going to be much more public, but the result, says David, is guaranteed. This uncircumcised Philistine who defied the armies of the living God is no better than an animal. And notice this, that as David speaks, something of faith begins to awaken in Saul. You remember that word confidence means with faith. Something of faith begins to awaken in Saul. The spirit begins to stir within him as he responds, go, and the Lord, first time he's mentioned the Lord for a very long time, go, and the Lord be with you. And the Anglican hearers and the congregation all responded, and also with you. <laughs> we'll wait till this afternoon to hear the final part of this great story, but let's draw together some strands now and how this might apply to us. Today's passage is all about what we might call our working theology, our working theology, the theology by which we actually live our lives as opposed to the theology that we claim to believe in. David, along with Eliab, Saul, and the Israelites, are all theoretically living by the same theology. They all believe in the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They all celebrate the Passover and everything that God achieved under Moses and Joshua. They know the Ten Commandments. They can probably recite large chunks of the law by heart. They have the same scriptures. They sing the same hymns. They listen to the same sermons. But in a very real sense, they are serving different gods. Their theoretical theology is identical, but their working theology by which they actually live their lives is poles apart. It's not Goliath who needs to hear the phrase, the living God. David never uses that phrase when he's talking to Goliath. It's the Israelite army and Saul who need to hear that phrase. And that's the context in which David speaks it. Because Saul and the people of God's working theology seems to be excluding the idea that God is alive. Instead, as we see from the early verses of this chapter, God is absent. In effect, God is dead. And amazingly, there are many people in our churches who are committed Christians and who love listening to good preaching and singing great hymns, and yet they are practical atheists or deists to give them their proper name for much of the time. Do you remember deism? It existed in the 18th century, still alive and well in the church. And deism, the idea was, well, yeah, God created this stuff, and then he pushed off, and he doesn't do anything in the world anymore. And that's what a lot of people, that's the working theology by which a lot of people uh, live. And the danger is, of course, for all of us, that we can gradually drift into that as our default option, our working theology. And so deists don't, take, don't live as though anything really depends on God. It all depends on me at the end of the day. It depends on me. I need to pull myself up by my own bootstraps. I need to make my way through life. Nothing depends on God. They don't take any risks for his sake. They certainly don't come over from Hong Kong and uh, brave uh, electric cookers and uh, <laughs> other challenges of living in this country. They don't take risks for his sake. There's no real sacrifice or faith or dependence on anything in their lifestyle that speaks of the living God at all. Other than going to church on a Sunday, some of them do that, some of them try and tune in on their pajamas, whatever it is, giving a bit of spare cash to the collection when it comes round, there's really not a whole lot that separates them from their non-Christian friends or neighbours. And what we call the gap between our working theology and our theoretical theology is hypocrisy. That is what that gap is called. And increasingly, that hypocrisy, which we can all drift into, talking to myself as much as anyone else, that hypocrisy, that deism, has no room within the church if we're to make any kind of impact on the spiritual forces raged against us. We just can't afford it any further. For let's face it, those forces are pretty scary. We were thinking about them yesterday. St. Paul reminds us in Ephesians 6 verse 12, our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Paul had experienced that in spades, in Ephesus itself, as he had come face to face 
with some of those spiritual forces in the world around, and they'd nearly broken him. Only a full-blooded, confident faith in the living God can hope to make an impact against such a foe. And it's especially at times like these, as we seek to rebuild after the ravages of COVID, and as the world seems to throw fresh challenges at us the whole time, and the ghastliness of what's going on in Ukraine and everything else, that we need to hear again that simple phrase, the living God, and begin to act on it, to allow it to affect our working theology and the way we live. It's vital because if the living God is for us, who can be against us? When he's here, victory is assured. Victory at all costs, victory in spite of all terror, victory however long and hard the road may be, for without victory, there is no survival. I'll never forget my first experience of Pentecostal worship in a large black majority church in southeast London. The service lasted about three hours and included fiery preaching, passionate praying and glorious singing. And it was an almost overwhelming experience. But what struck me most was the time given over to testimonies, frequently moving accounts of how God had been at work in the lives of members of the congregation. From my own perspective, a testimony was a well-prepared account of how I'd become a Christian several years before. A testimony was something that I could, could tell, you know, I had it written down, I learnt it by heart. That was what a testimony was. For these people, though, A testimony was far more fresh and immediate, speaking of events that had taken place entirely over the past week. And it wasn't that those events were trouble-free or even dramatic. Many of those stories talk of God's presence in the face of poverty and discrimination and sickness and bereavement. But there was an extraordinary alertness to the presence of the living God and the way that his life interacts with our lives. That was my experience in the early 80s. But in the years since, I've often come across two tendencies that are much less helpful. People on the one hand who worship God every week and sing and say all the right things, but who have no real expectation that God is around at all and are not willing to take any risks or make any sacrifices on his behalf. And people on the other hand who are open to the living God but who've become so dependent on a regular supply of healings and miracles that without that supply, their faith levels plummet. And to those with no expectation, I would say, pray for the ability to see the living God in you and around you. And to those dependent on too regular a miracle fix, I would say, pray for the discipline to deepen your faith so that you don't become vulnerable to the cold winds of discouragement, suffering and persecution whenever they cross your path, which they will. It's not that the miraculous is unimportant or irrelevant. Belief in the living God must include a belief in signs and wonders, and in my life I've been privileged to witness quite a few. But the sense that God is only at work at such times does no justice to his creation, his ongoing care for us, his presence with us in the tough times as well as the good times, the courage that he gives to Christian people in the face of suffering and death, his commitment to discipline us, which is painful, to transform us from the inside out. These two are signs that the living God is at work. And what challenges me alongside the working theology question is the reaction of Eliab and Saul to the confidence of David. Because I've seen those reactions in, my, in others, and I've sometimes, more troublingly, recognized them in myself as well. It is hard work being a committed soldier, as Eliab was, being a committed soldier of Christ year after year, decade after decade. Even when things are going well and we're outwardly successful, it's so easy to become tired and stressed and discouraged. And in that discouragement, to slow down in our own spiritual lives and almost grind to a halt. And the tough thing for church leaders and active church members, and for parents and teachers and business leaders as well, and I dearly wish this wasn't true, but it is, is that how we are affects the morale and the spirit of the people around us, especially the people whom we lead. Like Saul, our paralysis becomes their paralysis. So what do we do when a David comes along? 
What do we do when we hear of the living God at work in other places or when we come across people who really live their theology, people who are full of the Holy Spirit and of faith? I'll tell you what we can do. We can do an Eliab. We can quietly become critical, angry, dismissive. They're fanatics, we say. Do you know George Verwer used to define a fanatic? He said, what's a fanatic? He said, a fanatic is someone who's a more enthusiastic Christian than you are. (laughs) We're, they're fanatics, we say. Why do we do that? Well, because we're jealous deep down. We're jealous of God's anointing, the anointing of his spirit in their lives. We're jealous of their successes. And it's partly, too, because we're insecure in ourselves and we're frustrated at our own paralysis and inadequacy. Instead of remembering that we're part of the same family, we're part of the same team, so that we can rejoice in each other's successes and uh, be encouraged and challenged by one another's faith, we start acting as though we're rivals, we're competitors, even enemies. We had a motto in my staff team when I was a, a parish vicar down in Twickenham. The motto was saying from one of the Psalms, and it simply went like this, we will rejoice when you succeed. Is that a great motto? We will rejoice when you succeed. What happens when someone in a football team scores a goal, isn't it? Of course, someone else might have thought, well, I wish I'd scored that goal. But actually, there's, there's universal rejoicing in the team because it's part of a team. We will rejoice when you succeed. And it's the mark of great men and women, I believe, that we get beyond the Eliab reaction and allow ourselves to listen to others whose working theology is a whole lot more advanced than ours. Our theoretical theology might be a whole lot more advanced than theirs, but their working theology is streets ahead of ours from time to time. They may be older than us, they may be a whole lot younger, they may be children. Often children are far ahead of adults in their working theology, which is why Jesus encourages us to watch them and to listen to them and to learn from them. What do we do when the David comes along? Well, Saul's reaction is a bit better. Like Eliab, he's tempted to write off David, but at least he's prepared to listen. And as he listens to David, something changes within him. It's almost as though Saul has been frozen inside, and by allowing himself to listen to the red-hot faith and passion of young David, that ice begins to melt so that he can begin to name the name of the Lord once again. I've been in that position too, And I praise God for those passionate Christians who help melt my heart when it's got frozen. I haven't always appreciated them at the time, but I have desperately needed them. And just to finish on a rather unusual note, which is the question of David's reward. If David is really such a red-hot, fired-up believer, we might think, why is he so seemingly concerned about the reward that he might get if he takes Goliath on? He actually asks about it twice. If his passion is for the name of the living God, that the whole world will know that there is a God in Israel, as he puts it so powerfully later in the chapter, why does he seem concerned about money and tax breaks and getting the hand of Saul's daughter in marriage? Well, it can be, could be, of course, that David is simply presented here, as he is throughout the David story, as a normal human being like others, and that he often mixed his passion for God with less godly ambitions. That would be perhaps an encouragement to us that God can use ordinary people, flawed people like you and me. But there may be a deeper meaning here as well. Because Jesus speaks of rewards on many occasions. In fact, if you read the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 5 to 7, he talks about rewards quite a bit. It's not just that God will necessarily reward us with great wealth or tax exemptions or the hand of someone beautiful in in marriage. That's not the promise in the Sermon on the Mount. But the promise is this, that it's much more rewarding in every sense to walk by faith and not to be paralyzed by fear. Isn't it much more rewarding to be putting our talents to the best possible use, not cautiously burying them in the ground? Isn't it much more rewarding to be storing up treasure in heaven where moth and rust don't corrupt and gobble it up and where thieves do not break in and steal than to invest everything into the very transient economy of planet Earth? I don't know what rewards in heaven will look like, but I do know that when I meet my master face to face, 
And when we do sow and produce, we hope, we pray a few extra talents that we've earned for his kingdom, turning the one that he's given us to two, or the two to five, or the five to ten. The greatest reward of all will be to hear those words spoken over us. Well done, good and faithful servant. Come and enter your master's happiness. Shall we stand and shall we pray?